Aloha, it's your boy, Crypto Roots. So, we're just going to wait a little bit. We're going to start it slow. We're going to wait for people to log into the chat. We're just going to smoke a little herb. We're going to talk a little crypto, talk a little news. And then I'm going to get into crypto class about the gig economy and the peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. You know, so, so yeah, just hang out. I'm gonna ask this. I'll I'll do a little quick uh, quick uh, AMAs in the beginning. You know what I'm saying? So just uh, wait for people to log into the chat. You know, give it a second. One second, time to retry what the heck is going on here. Let me know. Press nine if you could uh press nine if you can hear me. Everything good? Let me know if I'm live. Let me know. Press nine in the chat. Let me know if y'all here. Apologize. We just we just waiting a little bit. We're waiting for everybody to get settled. for everybody to get settled. All right, cool. So I'm waiting for people to press nine. Yo, what's up? Love and Sky Joe. Press 9 if you if I'm coming through clearly. Press 9. I don't know why my internet don't want to work right now. Press 9 if you if I'm coming through clearly. What's good? What's good? The one. What's good? Yo, aloha. Press nine if I'm coming through clearly. Apologize. We just we just waiting a little bit. We're waiting for everybody to get settled. What's up? What's good? Please press nine. If I, if I'm coming through clearly, for some reason my. My phone, internet, don't want to work. Yo, what's up, Author King? What's up? Aloha. God damn. What's up? Press 9. All right, cool, cool, cool. We about to get into it. I'm about to light one up. For some reason, um, my phone data just don't want to work, so I can't see myself which kind of helps me. We about to get into it. Just give it a little bit. We about to do class. I got I got it's it's going to be a long class. I got over 20 slides. I got over 20 slides, so just give it just give it a few minutes. Waiting for more people to log in. Yo, Crypto Malala, what's up? Aloha, what's going on? The One, what's up? G Dev, what's up? Aloha. We got, we about to get started in a few minutes, so just hang in there. 
You already know it's gonna be a while. I understand if you can't make the whole class. It works, it's just glitchy. All right. That's just the way it's gotta be, man. I, I don't know what else I can do. Uh, internet be good until I'll be live streaming. The internet be good until I'll be live streaming. So, let's check it out. Today, um, New Zealand is the first country to allow companies to pay salary and wages with cryptocurrency. So it legalizes salaries paid with cryptocurrencies. That's a big, big deal. And it, so that's the first, that's the first. And my, uh, more countries are, 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 are gonna follow. So that's a big deal. And you see that, you see how this is taken over, man. It's like wildfire. It's like wildfire. So. hang in there y'all I just hope this works I can't really see myself damn man all right we about to start we about to start All right. All right, Crypto Malala, press nine if you can hear me. And I'm coming through. Once you press nine, I'm gonna get started. I'm gonna get started. So uh, I'm waiting for Crypto Malala. You good? Okay, I'm good. All right, let's get started, man. Let's get started. Here, I think I'm coming up. All right. You good, though. Okay. All right, Crypto Malala, press nine. All right, all right. I'm good. We're good. We're good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about all that. Sometimes this YouTube should be crazy. All right. I'm coming through. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Thank you, Crypto Class. All right. So we're going to be talking about uh, the gig economy. All right. So let me, let me start off with saying... Or you'll be understanding the gig, the gig economy. Now, some some of you guys may not have heard of that term, the gig economy. Well, have you ever been on Craigslist and have you ever went to a little section that says gig? What is a gig? What do band members play? This is for this is for beginners. I'm not just going to assume that everybody knows everything. So I'm gonna just go through from you know I'm just go through for everybody so we can all be on the same terms at the end. Now, a gig is uh, a short paid work so when band members go and play a stage that's a gig when you go and do something for a quick little little something little short amount of time that's a gig okay the economy is a way a understanding of how people send and receive money transactions uh, different climates of, of the economy this the economy is you know what's a great way to describe it it's just how people do business on a, on a, on a large scale. I w you know, that's the easiest way to put it. Now, um, essentially what it is, it's a, it's a peer to peer marketplace. Okay. Peer to peer. So what, 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 what's happening is, is that a lot of these companies, you no longer have to like go to a certain place and do a certain task for a certain amount of time. No, peer to peer is direct, for the most part, directly from me to you. We really haven't done that kind of business. It, it always had to be some sort of boss, some sort of workplace, you know what I'm saying? So now we have a peer to peer marketplace. What's a market where people buy and sell, okay? Peer to peer is directly from me, pretty much would be directly from person to person. P to P, peer to peer, person to person. All right. All right, and we know them all. We all know them. We all know Uber. We all know Airbnb. We all know. So it's like the freelance, uh, the freelance market as well for freelancers. And for you guys who don't know what freelancing is, it's when you're out for yourself. You're out for hire. People can hire you. You work for yourself. But I'm not. Obviously, there's pros and cons. But essentially, that's what freelance is. People are paying you 
for any given period of time for your your skills. You know what I'm saying? All right. All right. Now, take out your notes. We're gonna go into it. Um, and this is as unbiased as I can be. We've all, at least in this day and age, and especially if you live in a, a urban city, you either you're affected by the gig economy one way or another. Whether you use the services, whether you uh, work for the uh, the services, or whether people around you work and use those services, you know, and what it is is just a, a market of convenience. Essentially, that's the way I see it. It's a con uh, convenience. You're paying for a convenience. Now, we're gonna get into that. We're gonna get into that. All right. So, AKA Crypt Obama. You know what I'm saying? Crypt Obama. All right. The birth of the sharing economy. The gig economy is largely shaped by innovations in the early 21st century. TaskRabbit, founded in 2008, was formed when its founder needed to run an errand, buying food for her dog, but didn't have time to do so before going to dinner. TaskRabbit was revolutionary because it drew in people with free time to help those who had no free time, known as RunMyErrand.com in its early stages. Later that year, Airbnb was founded, allowing people to share free space in their homes. Uber developed a similar concept in 2009, bringing in people with free time and cars to help those who needed rides. So check it out. First of all, before I forget, go to NPR, uh, NPR radio, like podcast, and go to, it, it is, there's a podcast section called How I Built This. And look up the Airbnb, type in Airbnb, How I Built This, NPR. Yo, that is some, that is such a, because it, it's the owners of Airbnb and how they got started. And like, it is a crazy, crazy story. It is very inspirational. It, it's revolutionary. Like, you know, no one believed them. It, like, it's a great story. You know what I'm saying? And I appreciate entrepreneurs and people who are willing to push the boundaries of societal norms at that time. And, you know, outside of how they do it, I, I think certain people deserve a lot of respect you know, as far as uh, entrepreneurship. Now, what I've said in my other videos was that you wanna start a business? Well, find a problem that you're having and be the one to supply the answer to everyone else for that ex exact same problem and there you have a business. So the owner of TaskRabbit had to go somewhere and she needed some food for her dog but no one at the time, she couldn't really trust or there was no verification, there was no app, there was no type of way to just trust a stranger to go buy food for you and then, for your dog and then drop it off at your house or whatever may need happen. Like, there was no, you know what I'm saying? So I, I respect that. She found a problem and she was like, yo, man, I'm sure other people have this problem too. You know what I'm saying? The same thing with Airbnbs. Like, the dudes, they were they were late on their rent. So check this out. The Airbnb guys, they were college dudes, and they were working average jobs. They were paying whatever. They were kind of broke. And then the landlord raised their rent. And they were like, yo, like, all of a sudden. So they didn't even move. The landlord just upped up, upped up, upped up their rent. So... What happened was with the Airbnb guys, like, what happened with them, there was a, a, a Democratic convention. It was when Obama was trying to get elected, when he was running on Obama's campaign. And what happens with the, a lot of those conventions is that um, all the hotels, everything's are, are already bought up. And then there's a surplus of more people who can't really come or have no place to stay. So... What the Airbnb guys did, they were desperate. They they needed to pay. They were about to they were about to go, you know what I'm saying, get kicked out or, you know. So what they did was um they went on Craigslist and posted an ad for an air mattress. You need a place to sleep with an air mattress. And oh, no, 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 that, that that's 
the dude, all right, so check this out. Check this out. I'm trying to sum it up. The dude of Airbnb was like, he met a random guy at a coffee shop and they were talking and they had a good talk. And then the guy at the, at the, at the, um, the guy at the coffee shop and then the owner of Airbnb was like, yo, where, uh, that accidentally said, where are you staying tonight? To the dude he just met. And the dude he just met was like, honestly, I was about to ask you if I could stay at your place. And the dude, Airbnb guy felt so guilty and had such a good, he just didn't, it was almost too rude for him to say no. So the Airbnb guy reluctantly say, yeah, you can stay at my place. And that the Airbnb was like, yo, what the fuck? Well, what did I just do? Like, wow, like I'm letting this stranger stay at my house. Like I just met him. You know, the Airbnb guy's like, I didn't even get sleep that night. I stayed up, maybe I invited a murderer into my house. And uh, they woke up the next morning, they went out and had another coffee. And he was like, yo, that was chill. The other guy was like, thank you. I really I really needed a place to stay and da 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 And then there was, a, so that what's got him initially over the fact, like he was like, yo, that wasn't as bad of an experience. In fact, like that was actually kind of fun be that we got to hang out even more, you know? and he got to save money. And then so the next step was like, they're about to get kicked out and the Airbnb guys were like, yo, what if we just put up some air mattresses in our living room about like four? And what if we just post an ad on Craigslist for people who need a place? Because it's like a democratic convention. So they were like, yo, these are more intellectual type people, more like, you know, you know, secu financially secure people. So it ends up being that uh, he rented all, they rented all four air mattresses out for like the weekend for a few days and then they moved it they another four mattresses in another room and they made enough money to pay their rent that month and then that's what's really sparked it off that's what really sparked it off like desperation like needing to figure out something taking risk like you know what i'm saying and then they ended up having uh, the people that he met that ended up being the next step to get you know was the people that he met that he allowed to stay at the air, uh, the air mattresses on, on the floor, um, the Airbnb owners, the you know the ones. So I found the whole story pretty amazing, you know. So this is kind of how the birth of the share uh, combined with the, the the internet age, being able to transfer data so fast. You know what I'm saying? So um, yeah, so that's kind of how all this kind of got started. All right. Yeah, the previous infrastructure of technology was needed to make this a reality. This was always the case for innovation. So you couldn't have had Airbnb if it wasn't, you know what I'm saying? Like AOL had to come around. You know what I'm saying? MySpace had to come around. These these social like things had to happen in order for this for, to set the stage for this, you know what I'm saying? Data uh, faster forms of data, faster forms of Wi-Fi, faster uh, new technology and smartphones, like all that leads up into the next major innovation. You know what I'm saying? This this just didn't come out of nowhere. What, what happens is that when you're when you're building the next step up, you got to use everything else as a ladder. You feel me? And that's how um, that's how all innovation works is off previous technology. You know what I'm saying? Using using previous technology as building blocks, you know what I'm saying. So, so here's some key points to consider. Okay, there's a major difference between the job security and income of those who are creating this new economy, and that of gig workers who are generating the revenue one delivery delivery or right share at a time okay so there's a, there's a difference between people who are designing the software who are funding it, who are who are who are managers who are funding you know what i'm saying who are corporate leaders and in, in this world versus the people who are actually doing the work there's a there's a big difference big gap okay press 9 if i'm coming through clearly okay Press nine if you if you can hear me. I just want to make sure I'm coming through. Okay. There's a big yeah. There's a big gap. Okay. 
In the race to in the race to rapidly grow, the companies that utilize gig work, huge net losses are generated, significant signif signifying high risk of future investors and workers. So what these companies are actually doing, they're actually losing money every ride. I'm not joking. Lyft loses like one dollar and fifty cents. I think Uber and when they so they're actually losing money, millions of dollars uh, every year. These companies, a lot, I guess a lot, a lot of people don't know that. Oh, I, I appreciate it, you guys. Thank you, thank you for letting me know. So you would think these guys are actually making money every ride. It's not. That's not true. They're actually losing money. So that throw that that's a new that's a whole another that's a whole another factor we haven't really seen economically. How do we, how do you make money by losing money? How does that happen? How do these billion? How are they making money but they're actually like actively losing money per ride? We're gonna get into that. So this tactic, what it does is undercuts the competitors. All right, uh, the tactic under, uh, undercut competitors such as taxis and courier firms, the VCs, investors that propel their growth, significant returns on their money. So, what's what's happening is that Uber, because they they're driving the price down of a, of a ride, of a taxi ride, essentially, and Uber and Lyft are competing at each other and to get the cheapest price, right? Right. So now, Uber's Taking 150 of a loss, but uh, Lyft is willing to take 150 uh, one dollar and fifty three cents of a loss. So that drives the price down, makes it better for the consumer. Now, because these guys are battling the Uber and Lyft, you got these old companies, these taxis, these these uh, centralized, you know, what I'm saying platforms um, that are like being wiped out. Like, no way are you are are we going to pay that kind of fee? when we can just use Uber and Lyft and get better prices. So, the furious competition is excellent for consumers who get cheaper and faster and more t uh, technologically advanced services. What becomes of the human beings who generate the revenue by doing the labor? All right, so we can see that the consumer, this is all better for the consumer. We're getting more for less we're getting more we're getting faster more accurate routes we're getting more available drivers we're getting cheaper rides we're getting specialized rides whether you want uh nobody in the ride whether you want the taxi to not talk to you or whether you or want uh, a pool of people in the car you never met before like now we're getting specialized services with the advancement of technology for cheaper but Who's taking all that cost? Because that, who, 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 you know what I'm saying? Because the money's got to flow somewhere. Who's taking, who's, who's getting, who's taking the kick in the butt at the end of the day? And who's coming up in the game? Okay? So there is no job security. There is the stress of unpredictable income. There is a reliance on algorithms to get work. Rating systems cast their judgment. So there you have it. There is no job security. Okay? Um, and we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about these different things. Now, that's, so that's, that comes with the territory of freelancing. Okay? That you don't know when you're going to get your next dollar. Your next meal. So that, for some people, that for... A lot of people can stress them out uh, and some people uh, enjoy enjoy the unpredictability now reliance on algorithms to get work so that's out of your control you don't control these algorithms you never coded them you don't know nothing about computers so now you're relying on something else that's thinking way faster than you to get some work we're gonna get into that and you got rating systems so rating systems, they could be fair, they could not be fair. There's so many little details that it comes to when it comes to these uh, decentralized rating, rating systems, okay? 
if labor laws change and these companies cannot operate as they currently do, or if cities and countries ban them all together, gig workers may quickly find themselves out of a job with no safety. The VCs are safe from having diversified investment portfolios, and the software engineers who built the apps can easily look for another job in the same field. So check this out. Not only do you not have any job security, not only do you not know when, how much or when you're going to get paid, not only do you, you got to rely on some software to get you work, all right? But if the whole shebang, if, if the, the company that goes down uh, some, uh, uh, or the governments or jurisdictions outlaw the company uh, from doing business in that area, you're, you're out of work, bro. You're out of work, bro. And this is not taking shots at nobody. This is just what it is. And a lot of people are, are, are aware. We're going to get into that. A lot of people are aware of these circumstances. And that's a key topic um, I, want, I want to bring up later. You know what I'm saying? Give me a second. Because the people who design these apps, the software engineers, the uh, the venture capitalists, you know what I'm saying? They're good. They could just move on to the next app. They could just move on to the next big thing. But the people who are working these, once that once that out, they they necessarily can't just move on to the next app because what if that app and and that type of business is just banned in the whole country or the whole state? Right, so there's no sympathy for gig workers, even if they complain, protest, or strike. If you don't like it, you can quit. Lack of sympathy from the public, the corporations, and the governments. The, they don't really give a shit. You don't have to do gig work, bro. So the, you know what I'm saying? Even Uber stated in their IPO that our business would be adversely affected if drivers were classified as employees instead of independent contractors. So. They classify you as independent contractors, so they don't have to pay any of your benefits, any of your, uh, uh, any type of medical, any type of insurance. Nah, nah, that's all on them. That's all on them. They're independent contractors because it would actually take. They wouldn't be able to function as a company if they had to pay benefits to all, all, all their employees or workers. It's just, it's just the truth. So what what that ha that means? You're on your own if you get sick, if you get hurt. You can't you can't really leverage anything with these uh, Uber and Lyft like you could do with a regular job. You can't really you know what I'm saying like you can't leverage anything. You didn't you didn't you know. So so that's another way you take these people. You you take a loss or a potential loss. It's the way you see it. Oh, we'll get into that. Like I keep saying, I got a lot of slides. So Lyft, like I said, Lyft loses one dollar fifty cents per ride. Imagine how much they will lose if they had to pay securities and benefits for every worker. So check this out. It's a new labor model mixed with bad historical habits. So we never seen this type of like work before, but as far as people not getting the benefits and resources and uh, things they need while working, that's that's been historical, bro. That's that done happened so many times throughout history. So it's just a new labor model. So we're going to go over some stats, okay? Give me a second. All right, so we're going to go over some stats, so, uh, some statistics, okay? So this may take a little bit, but like I said, I do my I do the work, I do the I do the research and this is crypto class, so we're not just going to skim through things. We're going we're going to go into it. Workers are put into groups or labeled by their motivation to work for the company based on how many hours they put in. So they're like categorized. So how many hours you put in, you're in like, they, they categorize you so they can analyze your data. It's called data mining. That's how essentially uh, this, uh, they are able to do all this is data mine. So they data mine their employee, uh, their workers. All right, based on how many hours they work, I guess within a week. A 2015 analysis published by Uber's head of policy research found that 51% of drivers work 1 to 15 hours a week, okay? 
51 over almost pretty much half of the drivers work anywhere from 1 to 15 hours per week. 30% work 16 to 34 hours a week. 12% work 35 to 49 hours a week. And 7% work more than 50 hours a week. It could be therefore... Uh, it could therefore be observed that a compar comparatively small portion of Uber drivers are responsible for majority of the rides. You see? So, s s roughly anywhere from what? Almost 20%? We're going to add 12% to the 7% are the majority of what's bringing in the revenue for Uber itself. So, because of how many uh, these small, small number of people just be like, yo, I live Uber. I live it. I sleep in my car. I'm Uber, Uber, Uber. In fact, I don't even sleep. I do coke and I Uber all night long. You know what I'm saying? Like, some people just bought that Uber life. Like, and I'm not hating on nobody. Like I said, this is, this is not, this is strictly educational, informational. You know what I'm saying? But we, we all know some people who just Uber 24-7. 24-7. You know what I'm saying? I ain't mad at you. I ain't mad at you. I ain't mad at you. Trust me. I ain't mad at you. Um, all right. Pew Research Center reported that 56 of 56% 56 of surveyed gig workers were financially relying on gig work. All right. More than half were reliant on the gig work itself versus 42% who could live comfortably without the income. So more than half of the people need the work. Okay. 42% of the people are like, it's whatever's. It's all good, you know? Given that 57 million people in the United States alone are taking part in, in the gig economy, nearly 24 million people are using it as earned supplemental income as, uh, are clearly reaping the, uh, the reward of additional flexible work as the pre at the press of a button. Work like work that didn't exist until companies like Uber were created. All right. So what that means, so basically, People are like, yo, this is cool. Like, I'm down with this. Like, I like the flexibility. I I, I like working for myself, uh, essentially. I, I, I like doing my own thing whenever I feel like it. So, people, people, people obviously navigated to that. And the majority of those people actually rely on that as, as, a, as a full social income. Okay. Additional studies show that for some, for some, gig work can be much better than available alternatives. In 2018, study of Uber drivers in the United Kingdom showed that the vast majority of the UK's drivers are male immigrants, primarily drawn from the bottom half of the London income distribution. These immigrant workers moved into the gig economy from, from permanent part or full-time jobs that reported higher life satisfaction than in their previous jobs. Although the drivers are, are still in lower income bracket, many are earning more money through Uber than they were before and are able to do so on their terms. A, a similar US-based study in 2017 reported that driving for Uber gave workers flexibility, flex, flexibility that was unmatched <coughs> by other working arrangements and often greater pay. All right, so now I don't like to use the term immigrants, and you know what I'm saying you got people who just don't have the right documents to get to fit into this centralized society, and you know, and it's not their fault. If they could, they would. And this is this is a lot of different places for a lot of different countries, but that's not going to stop people from living there, you know. So some people were working jobs. They didn't even like they didn't want to do but they had no other choice now they're able to have more freedom and they're actually happier and have more satisfaction and making better money even though <coughs> they may be on the lower income of society as you know they actually feel better you know what I'm saying they actually you know what I'm saying so Who's you know I'm saying this is and this is due to the gig economy. You know what I'm saying so. We're looking at the pros and cons. 
we're looking at the goods and the bads. <coughs> and we're trying to weigh them and see what are we what are, what are, what is society what's happening with the world? How is the world changing? Okay? And then, by the way, the gig economy is a glo most for the most part it's it's more of a it's growing as a global economy. Which is different. Which is way different. You know? Which is which is way different. Generally, there are two. So generally, there are two main types of gig workers. All right. Those who need it, and those who don't. Okay. Pretty much, that's just that's the way the game is. Depending on what side you're on, if uh, it is how I should put is how much. Of an advantage the gig economy has for you or over you. Sorry about all that. <coughs> oh man. <coughs> Ooh. Give me a second. So basically, if your gig job is your side hustle and you make money elsewhere, you would considerably be more economically stable than someone who's working the gig full time because of the sort the certain benefits it has. But the only reason they're really working that gig <coughs> is because they have little to no skills to rely on. And that gig is their best option. You feel me? So that's the difference. If you're using the gig economy as just an extra source of income, another way to make bread, and you make more of your bread some other place, then you're using it as, you know what I'm saying? A way to kind of get ahead. But if you but if you only went to the gig economy because of the flexibility and the slightly better pay, and you realize you couldn't go anywhere else and you still can't go anywhere else and if you're doing the gig economy full time you're not learning or gaining any skills to get out of that <coughs> so that's your best option so that's 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 something to consider all right sorry man i gotta get used to talking this long so we're gonna talk about venture capitalists, VCs, the big boys in the game. You know what I'm saying? What is a venture capitalist? One second. According to uh, Investopedia, a venture capitalist is an investor that provides capital to firms exhibiting high growth potential in exchange for an equity stake. This could be fun. This could be funding startup ventures or supporting small companies that wish to expand, but do not have access to equity markets. Venture capitalists are willing to risk investing in such companies because they can earn a massive return on their investments if these companies are a success. VCs experience high rates of failure due to the uncertainty that is involved with the new and unproven companies. So VCs, <coughs> they're the big dudes. You come, you pitch an idea. Or they like your idea? They may throw some bread at it, just so you can get the ball rolling. See, you know what I'm saying? They, but they know that it's a risk. They know there's a bunch of companies that are bound to fail, but they're looking for the unicorns. That's what they call them in the um, tech industry. The unicorns, the, the, the rare breeds, the Airbnbs, the Uber, Airbnb got turned down like six times, bro. Everyone thought they was crazy when they pitched their idea. The initial question of who is funding growth is typically straightforward. It's venture capital firms. This shouldn't be surprising. Most hyper-growth technology companies since the dot-com boom have expanded rapidly by taking on millions of dollars in VC cash in return for equities of the company. So, yeah, they get equity of the company. <coughs> We're going to talk about how they make money, though. Because remember, they're, they're, 
they're netting at a loss. They're losing money every ride, multi millions of dollars a year. And these guys are the ones funding the company. So how does this all work out? How does this all work out? You feel me? We gonna get into that. We gonna get into that. All right, press nine if you can still hear me. Just let me know I'm good. Let me know I'm good. Let me know I'm good. Press nine. Okay. MVP, AKA minimum viable product. Okay. Most efficient, cost-effective application to throw on the market to gauge for future development. Just slap it together, throw it out there. Let's see. Let's see if people go for it. You know what I'm saying? Just, just, just go for it. Make it work. Make it work. Let's see if people. Let's see if people. And then, and if people start biting it, people start going for it. That's when we kick it into gear. That's when we get a new user interface. That's when we get. Uh, social media t a team that's when we start hiring more people start expanding is when people but instead of taking a long time to get to get the best product out there or to add new features nah just put put a little bit make a little beginner app and then let's see if they snatch let's see if they snatch that's how that's how they that's how they that's how the game works Word, I appreciate you guys letting me know. <clears throat> All right. So we got to go over it. We got to talk about it. It's unavoidable. We got to talk about condi conditions for gig workers. Okay? Conditions. The convenience comes at a cost for both parties. Although most workers are satisfied with their conditions, we still see rare cases of events that happen in the news. So for the most part, the dude you're getting the ride from, or the, the, the person you stay in the Airbnb, they cool. They ain't gonna bother you. But every now and then, you get, a, you get these random cases of you know some wacko shit happening on YouTube or in the news, and that's kind of what scares people. <clears throat> okay? So you have everything from mental health issues that arise all the way up to suicides. You got harassment issues, you got theft issues, you got things that happen between people and strangers in different environments, you know what I'm saying? And uh, under different, uh, you know, say, intox intox intoxications. Random things happen and that's Everyone is aware, like we're all aware, but random things can happen anywhere, in a, in a regular workplace, in a military, like random things, all, you know what I'm saying? So, but yeah, this is something to keep in mind. Like it definitely is, it definitely is. It unjustly classifies individuals as independent contractors in order to pr deprive them of employee rights. So you ain't getting nothing from us, says Uber, says TaskRabbit, says Postmates. Uh-uh-uh, you ain't trying to take our shit. You know what I'm saying? Y'all on your own. Y'all independent contractors. When you sign what? It's the, not the W, W9, the 1099. You, you gotta sign the 1099, I think so. I, I never, we're gonna get, get into about my experience, uh, but I think they, it's 1099 independent contractor. Let me know in the chat if that's, <clears throat> that's the tax form you gotta fill out. But, so, not, yeah, that, that takes that takes it all out. No medical, no insurance, no dental, no none of that. None of that. No HR, I don't think so. Organizations are demanding minimum payouts and recruitment freeze to ensure there's enough work to go around for the already employed. So not only do not only uh, do they uh, they they are not getting mandatory payouts because you may not make nothing, but you may not make nothing because there's so many, uh, so many uh, employees on the market. I've, I've talked to Uber drivers, like, yo, there's so many Uber drivers, but not enough passengers. So many, you know what I'm saying? So that, 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 that's like, yo, like we ain't even gonna make a minimum wage this week or this day or whatever, you know what I'm saying, this hour. So what happens is that they want some of these companies to actually stop hiring people. 
Stop letting new workers in. Stop letting new drivers on get. Stop letting them so there's enough uh, fish in the sea for everybody that's already an Uber driver. You know what I'm saying? That's already it. You know what I'm saying? So now, now that's that's a new thing. Yo, like stop hiring people. You're gonna tell these tech companies who who work in multiple countries to stop hiring people. I mean, you know what I'm saying? And then pay them. Pay a minimum wage. Like what? What are they? Regular companies? What are they? Regular? No. It's a, it's an app, yo. It's an app. It's a tech company. You know what are we? They they they're operating on a whole nother wavelength. You know what I'm saying? Similarities. All right. Similarities between this work and like actual real legal work. So there's a parallel with the controversy over so-called zero hours contracts in the in the United Kingdom, also known as casual contracts. The employee is on call to work when the company needs them. They do not necessarily have to be given any work by the company and they do not have to have they do not have to work when asked, but can be seen as a way of exploiting workers and guarantees them no safety net uh, or known work hours. Unlike the gig economy, UK law mandates a mandatory minimum wage and statutory annual leave so that this is close to something that's already you know like uh, a legal thing It's called uh, zero hours or casual contracts where they can just you're on call it's whenever it's like whatever like no big deal show up whenever homie like you good like you still work for the company but they're not the company's not guarantee you anything but the law can mandate the the company to uh, give you a minimum and to give you certain time off that's what the law so the law can mandate the company but right now we haven't seen it yet can the law actually mandate the tech companies we haven't got to that point in history yet <clears throat> we haven't got and that's what people are pushing pushing towards so much more much more variables and unknown circumstances are in control uh, of how much you earn as a gig worker with the most risk out of all job types. So you got the most unknown things that can happen to you, whether that be crazy strangers, uh, whether that be no workers, whether it be uh, too many workers, or where, um, d different work hours, different law. And, and if, if, the, if a uh, jurisdiction company or uh, server crash or something takes out like, you know what I'm saying? You're taking out of all the job types, these gig workers are taking the most risk with the most unknown, unpredict uh, unpredictable, you know what I'm saying, circumstances. So we got to we gotta take a second and really look at it. Is this really something beneficial to us or to society? You know what I'm saying? And we still have yet to really see it all play out. Um, yeah. So, let's take a look into history. You know what I'm saying? Let's look into history. There have been numerous times in history in which workers were flocking to jobs with poor conditions. One notable period was the Industrial Revolution. Wages were low and work was monotonous and unregulated. Poor conditions for workers led to backlash, protests, and attempts to uni union uh, un unionization. Never said that word in my life before. All right. However, the surplus of available work during the Industrial Revolution was continually filled by mass immigration to the UK. Ensuring that factory workers never had a uh, staff shortage, this lessened the effect of labor unions since the effect of strikes and walkouts were minimal. Alright? So if we just take a quick look back into history, we can see this shit already play out. Already play out. Where yo like this is it this is the way everybody's making money well you know what we don't give a shit because we got more people coming in more people so that drives the prices down of the labor work and the people we're trying to fight back are not they're not as effective because more people keep coming in to fill the jobs you know what i'm saying more people keep coming in to fill the jobs so it's like yo like and the people who fill in the jobs are like, yo, this was better than the other shit I was doing. Or this was better than not having no money. So, <clears throat> so people were putting up with the poor conditions just because this was the best that was out there. For them, at least. And this is really, uh, you know what I'm saying? So if we just look, this has already happened before. 
But we're looking at this is a tech app uh, revolution. This is it. You know what I'm saying? It's a tech app revolution. So this shit's already happened before, man. We already seen seen this on a mass scale too, on a mass scale. Now let's talk about regulations. All right. Legislation will t take too long to catch up to technology and the needs of society, and it always does. You think these old old dudes really know anything about technology and where it's going and like what should be done about it and that like it's gonna take them forever years to actually put something into law that mandates what you know what society feels these uh, these tech companies should really be doing with their platforms so they're these tech companies are like runaway you know what I'm saying? Like they're, they're just like they're on their own. They they just bandits. Like these tech companies, like it's gonna take a while for you to catch up. But we move in anyway. We move in anyway. And that same thing with uh, I'm sure there uh, I'm sure there was. Um, so with uh, uh to the um uh, G Deb yeah. So there was um immigrants moving everywhere in all different types of places in all different types of history. So. Um, that was just one reference. So, should we hold tech companies accountable to, and to what extent? <coughs> should we hold tech companies accountable? A lot of people are going to say yes. Some people may say no. The tech companies may say no. And to how far? How far are we holding them accountable? You know what I'm saying? This is this is all up in the air right now. This is all up in the air. And that's what's that's why it's gonna take legislation so long to catch up. You know what I'm saying? Figure out what's going on. Cause they never seen this before. They never expected this before. No one really saw this coming. As a consumer, you gotta ask yourself, honestly, as a consumer, would you to ensure that people are gonna have better conditions, would you pay more per ride? Would you pay two or three more dollars per ride to ensure that your driver was taken care of on, on uh, more than he, he actually is now? Think about it. Or are, are you willing to wait longer for your rides and or pay more for your rides to ensure, you know what I'm saying? And I don't know, some people be like, hell no, nah, man, I ain't paying. No, I'm trying to pay cheaper for my rides and I want them faster. But at what expense? You you having a really bad driver with a really bad attitude who who just doesn't you know what I'm saying who's just driven to the point of like nobody respects him and you know what I'm saying he's stressed out he's got bills to pay and or are you willing to take uh, an extra ride where people are just like hella cool hella chill you know what I'm saying like you know they they actually willing to have you know what I'm saying go the extra mile for you just a little better service you know what I'm saying think about it that's what you got to ask yourself. Yeah, would you pay uh, to ensure better wages and less stressful work conditions? You know what I'm saying? Like, are you be like, you know what? Instead of rushing, take your time, brother. Take your time. You know? Are you what? What at what cost does it come to you to make sure that the person who's who's giving you a service is 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 feeling better about the service? Think about it. Think about it. Okay. So how do these tech companies make money? How do these tech companies make money? You know what I'm saying? Because Uber and Lyft, they own no cars. And they don't drive cars. Okay? They don't own the cars and they don't drive the cars. Airbnb doesn't own the homes. And they don't, they don't they, you know what I'm saying? They don't even, even rent the homes. They're not, Airbnb's not looking for the places to stay and they don't have the places to stay, essentially. Postmates don't make the deliveries. They ain't, Postmates is not going and delivering it. You know what I'm saying? YouTube doesn't really create content, not really for profit. YouTube is a content creator platform, platform for, for content creators, but it doesn't really create content, especially not for a profit. 
They own all the data of people who do and the they and people who are looking for it. So Uber owns all the data of people who have cars and willing to give people rides, and they own the data of people who don't have a car and looking for a ride. Airbnb, they own the data of people who have homes and willing to rent them out. They own the data of people who are looking for homes. Postmates, TaskRabbit, own the data of people who need who need things done, own the people of data who are looking to do things, make things get done. YouTube, own the data of people who are creating content like this. So it's about the data. It's all about the data. It's all about the data. That's what these tech companies, that's what they want. What they want. Why? Because it's digital gold. The data is where the money is at. So they collect the data. They analyze the data. They send and receive the data. That's what they do. That's how they make their money. Facts. Humans serving computers. Uh oh. Dun, dun, dun. All right. Humans serving computers. As human bosses disappear, AI will increasingly become our new bosses. And as AI bosses become pervasive, gig workers begin to begin to seem like only a temporary solution. What is more efficient and less expensive than software directing humans uh, beings to work is software directing other software to work. A smartphone servant we've become and a robotic butler. I'm not taking shots, but a software servant, a smartphone tells you, you yes, right, yes, right, yes. Another guest, yes, yes. The AI starts to, to make you work. And a robotic butler, yes, whatever it is you tell me to do, I will go do it. I will go serve it. I will go pick it up. I will go drop it off. I will, I will invite the stranger into my home. You know what I'm saying? This is, this is where humans really... And so at a certain point, you're not even going to need the humans because it's easier for software just to direct software. You know what I'm saying? These kinds of startups are not simply selling software. They're leverage, leveraging software to scale a traditional service economy. Companies like Uber, Lyft, Postmates, and Rents use these apps to consolidate what would tr tr traditionally be a plethora of local businesses serving a local area into a single held global economy. That should have been on a different slide, but what that means is they're, and they're, they're taking a bunch of companies that would be spread out and they're bringing them all closer to you. You know what I'm saying? And then they're killing the mom and pop shops while they're doing it. You know what I'm saying? And they're, they're taking different, like, you know what I'm saying, different businesses, and they're bringing all Uber Eats, Uber Rides, and they're going to be like Uber Flights, like Uber Mail. Like, they're taking all that, and they're uh, conglomerating them. They're making them, like, nah. So the mom and pop shops are, like, bling, 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 dying out. Dying out, left and right, faster and faster. So we're going to talk about the ultimate big come up. So how do they come up? Some argue that the race for Lyft, Uber, and their uh, siblings to initial public offerings is partly driven by investors and founders looking to cash out at the highest possible valuation before labor laws catch up with them and potentially break the model that was giving them their multi-billion dollar valuations. So, these guys come up, the VCs and the, the, the big dudes, they make the billions, because they're losing millions, they make the billions when they, uh, when they go public, initial public offering, when they sell the shares of the company to the public. That's when they cash out. That's when they cash out. And because you're buying in, the public is buying in at a high, you know, everybody, oh, you better get a piece of Uber. You better get a piece of Airbnb. Like, yo, these guys are in, you know, the, the public's thinking, yo, these guys are going to be here for good. The investors are like, yo, it's time to cash out because the game is about to get crazy. 
and these the, the the other guys are trying to shut us down with these laws and regs. So it's time to kind of get in and get out, you know. But what they're literally really really doing. So what drives the best valuation for the exit of a SaaS, which is a software as a service company? Some of the typically important metrics are as follows. So this is how they they figure out when's the when's the when's the best time to get out while the getting's good. So they look at the revenue, the amount of money made through sales. They look at that, the VCs and the big guys, the revenue growth, how much that revenue increased year after year. So how much, how much money is this growing year after year? The net retention rate, the percentage of customers who stay with the service rather than canceling. So the people who are like, yo, we down with Airbnb, we down with taskmates, like that's all I use. That's all I use. Total addressable market, the size of the market uh, that is out there for the business, the revenue, opportunity, the future. So what they're really doing, why they're taking so much of a loss every ride and year after year is because they want the market dominance. They're willing to take, they're willing to give you more for less, more service, better, you know what I'm saying, more drivers, but and for less money. So that they, so that more people are like, yo, I'm only riding Uber. I'm only using Airbnb, even though those alternatives like Lyft and uh, I don't know what other uh, um, home sharing alternatives, but because there's so many competitors, what these VCs are like, yo, let's just take up as much of the market as possible and we'll take a loss in the meantime. But as soon as we got the market as optimal as possible, like 70%, 60% people use our product, our service, our app, we're going to cash out at the top. And that's where we're going to come back up. That's where we're going to make up for all the losses and then some. Okay? So this is how these guys, these investors um, figure out like, yo, we got it. The, t the clock is ticking. And these, these laws and these governments, these regulations come in. Let's look at our business. Let's see how much money we made. Let's see how many people are dedicated. Let's see. All right. All right. Ching, ching. IPO. Cash out. Going public. And then that's when they take it. Bounce. And move on to the next. Move on to the next. All right. Give me a second. So we gotta ask ourselves, what is freedom for a gig worker? Because gig workers are going, they're, they're joining the gig economy for more freedom. But we have to ask ourselves, what is freedom for a gig worker? What is, what is, what is freedom? Because we, do we enjoy not actually having a boss? Most people would say, yeah, like, I like it. I get to work for myself, I get to drive for my, I get to make my own hours, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? But the truth is that gig workers do have a boss. Dun dun dun. Yeah, man, that's the truth. If you work for if you work for the gig economy, you do have a boss. You do have a boss. That boss is an algorithm. That boss is a software application of computer code. That is your boss. That tells you what you need to be doing, what you should. Well, now let's check this out. It tells you what's available and what could be done. Now let's get into human psychology. Ride sharing algorithms rely on a complex mathematical models to assign drivers to riders, determine rates and routes, and incentivize extra drivers to hit the road. Incentivize extra drivers to hit the road. It sounds awfully close to AI. We have traded in our old human bosses for new software bosses. In fact, this is just the beginning. Computer bosses may have begun with the gig economy, but they are going to pervade many, if not all, industries in the coming decades. Algorithms push notifications to drivers when they should drive uh, if they want to earn more money. With ride-sharing wages f uh, falling overall, the lure of higher wages on certain days and at certain times is pushing drivers to have more regular regimented hours. Check this out. So the algorithm does all the math, it checks everything out, but it's like notification, yo, there's money. Yo, there's money right now. Yo, 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 yo hey, hey, look how much you could be making. You could be making a little extra right now. Yo, there's, there's a few gigs right around the corner. In fact, there's a gig across the street. In fact, your roommate wants you to run a gig right now. Like, so the computer, the algorithm figures all this out, and essentially, 
because we joined it to earn money, now the money's being flashed in our face. Um, but you know what I'm saying? We have the we have the so-called free will to choose. But what ends up happening is that the algorithm starts enticing you on quote unquote your off schedule. Either late at night, early in the morning, on your day off, your kids at school, your kid, you about to pick up your kid from school, like the algorithm starts hitting you in and, and times where you're not really always ready in work mode, but because it's so random, you know you need to work. And the algorithm's like, yo, there's money. There's money. There's money. So, no more nine to fives. No more nine to five. Ask, no more nine to five if you're, if you're a gig worker. I mean, you could, you, could, you could try. You could try, but check this out. It's more like 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. Or it's more like 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Or, you know, anywhere from 7 p.m. to 11, you know what I'm saying? Now you got all type of irregular work hours because the algorithms, and this is where people's times and schedules, and this is where you make the most amount of money in these segments, and you're taking a little break. This, so we're seeing the old nine to five disappear, disappear. And you can't really work a nine to five and then work a gig. I mean, you could try. I'm sure you can make it work, but they conflict. They conflict. A regular nine to five conflicts with, you know what I'm saying? The gig, uh, the algorithm uh, work hours. All right, Crypto Malala, am I good? I'm coming through? Am I coming through? Let me know. All right, all right. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just telling it how it is. I'm breaking it down, man. I did the research, I did the homework, I'm, and then I'm gonna break down my own personal experience about it as well. You know what I'm saying? So who wins in the end? When we look at the effect of a VC subsidized economy, the consumer wins by getting a better service at a lower price. The companies win by growing at an accelerated rate and capturing market share. And the VCs give themselves a better chance at getting a return on their investment. However, the subsidization, subsidization of services in the gig economy often hits the workers directly. Subsidi subsidization. Some new words, man, some new words. When their income and rights are compared to those who fund and develop the software, they're truly second-class citizens. Yo, that hurts. But like, let's look at it. If you compare the income and the rights, the, the resources and benefits these people have of creating the app, developing the app, maintaining the app, promoting the app, advertising on the app, you know what I'm saying? Versus the people who actually work and do the work for the app, you would see that we're, we're would be considered, we're building a, a, a second class citizen because these people are riding on every gig as if it was their only piece of gold, like the gold rush, you know what I'm saying? So, this is just what's this is just what's happening in society, man. And I'm just bringing awareness by talking about it on my channel, you know, bringing awareness. Artificial intelligence. Let's talk about it. The bulk of media coverage about the threat of AI displacing workers. Cons uh, concentrates on low-skill, monotonous work, whether driving or manufacturing. Indeed, these will be the first major industries affected in an extremely visible way. There are millions of truck drivers in the United States alone, not to mention the hundreds of thousands driving for ride-sharing companies. And ride-sharing companies do not mince words. They seek to remove the drivers. This is the logical conclusion for the path these companies have followed. However, AI-induced unemployment will not be limited to the working class. So, these, these, these companies are like, yo, let's just get rid of these humans. Like, they want rights, they want benefits, they want this, they want tax. You know, let's just get rid of them. They cause too much problems. There's too many harassments. There's too many sexual this. We cost us too much uh, uh, media, public... PR to try to battle with so many lawsuits like let's get rid of the humans let's have the self-driving cars give give rides and 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 we will we'll take it from there 
And not only that, you got people who are just going to be out of jobs because you got self-driving truck now, trucks now. And it will be safer for these. So that's a whole different conversation. But AI wants to replace the people who own the homes. You'll be able to unlock the home with your phone. And it will be owned by Amazon or, or, or Uber homes. You feel me? Where the old Uber car pulls into the Uber home. And, and you got Uber uh, food delivered to you from a drone. You feel me? How many jobs did that just take away? You know what I'm saying? Think about it. So, why even have the humans? They, they, they complain too much. They want too much. They're too much of a liability to our dollar. That's what these companies are thinking. That's what we're not thinking, knowing. And that's what they're already implementing. You feel me? It's for real. It's for real, for real. So let's talk about the future of that. What's the next step? What is the next step of this peer-to-peer -peer marketplace? Because, woo, it's about to get crazy. It's about to get crazy. So peer-to-peer -peer decentralized applications are the next ones. I, I was gonna go through, um, I, I was gonna go through, but I'm not. So they already have, uh, oh, check out Crypto Cribs. Crypto Cribs is a great example. So it's Airbnb for cryptocurrency, crypto kid, cribs, check that out. And then there's already uh, different types of crypto uh, dApps, decentralized applications for Uber, but you use Ethereum. So now we're using the blockchain. Now we're using unstoppable, uncensorable uh, applications to do, we're not using Uber. We're not, you all, all of them, they're all centralized. So now, you literally directly, securely, anonymously, and, and uh, can verifiably, reputationally get a ride from someone using the blockchain then, and, and receive a ride with your phone anonymously, securely, you know what I'm saying? Be able to go to a house and then everything's valid on the blockchain. They have different reputation systems. You know, this is, and it's encrypted, it's hashed. So now we're, it's gonna be everything that you're seeing but on the blockchain. And this can be done more transparently, more securely, and more anonymously. It would be actually safer with this technology. And you'll have more, I would, it would, it would lead to having more or, uh, unions, decentralized unions. I never heard of that before, but like a DAOs that would protect your rights as a driver and as a writer. I mean, we can take it to the next level. So, and, we're, and we, we won't be using a centralized uh, currency like we do with USD and uh, Uber and uh, you know TaskRabbit we and so the the currency can come right away or be put into smart contracts and make sure that the ride was actually done well things weren't later damages weren't done and then the money gets released so yeah self-driving cars that use cryptocurrencies self-driving cars that either you own the car or the car kind of owns itself and uses and has an AI that has a wallet within the self-driving car. I'm not joking, man. This is around the corner. Check out Tesla just did it with, uh, I think Jaguar, one of them. Tesla got the AI uh, with, the, with the Tesla. Yeah. So you got AI chatbots. You got a chatbot in the self-driving car. So you got the, you have an AI that chats with you in the self-driving car, finds out where you want to go. All you have to do is talk to him, tell him, "No, nah, slow down. Can you go here? Can you pull over here?" Da 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 da, and and use that in a decentralized way. So everything will be peer to peer. Everything, because you can securely, uh, verifiably, and reputably uh, share your car with other people. Have your self-driving car make money for you. You could actually uh, crypto cribs your home. You can crypto cribs your home, but you could also crypto cribs. You can also um, peer to peer your personal belongings, certain expensive speakers, certain. And you can, and if you don't get your money, if they don't return the product, you already get your money back. You already get the payment that's already locked in the smart contract. No, we don't have to. You don't have to fight anyone. You don't have to uh, go and um, they got decentralized reputation systems and decentralized jurisdictions or uh, dispute systems like 
where there's no one person that controls it. And so you could actually rent out securely, more securely now and anonymously, your personal belongings and then have collateral for everything that's rented out if it doesn't get returned to you. And then that reputation, everyone around on the Ethereum network knows that you did not return that item. And that's why the money was by that time. And that's why the money. So then that hurts your reputation. You know what I'm saying? So imagine making a living off just renting out everything you own. You're not even going to work. Somebody needs to borrow your laptop for, you know what I'm saying, that for a weekend. You good money because they already put up collateral. They have a reputation to protect. And, you know what I'm saying? And it looks like you're a more trustworthy person because you're loaning out more personal things more smaller things, you know what I'm saying? Oh, I need some headphones for the weekend. You know, you can just pay someone in Ethereum real quick, get your headphones back two days later. You know what I'm saying? So now, now we're seeing, it's gonna change everything. Everything's peer to peer. Yo, I got a seashell. Yo, let me borrow that seashell. All right, throw down $3 of Ethereum on the smart contract. I'll give it back to you two, uh, <laughs> two nights from now. I get my seashell back. Da, da 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 His reputation goes up. My reputation goes up. You see where all this is going? And there's no central authority. Whew. Man. So it's recorded in a smart contract with collateral. will be recorded on the blockchain. And also, these smart contracts can be legally binding. So you could actually be held legally for not doing certain things or holding up to certain uh, forms of the smart contract based on your jurisdiction. Like in Tennessee, smart contracts are already legally binding. That's the next step. So that's the next step. So what if somebody doesn't fulfill an agreement on a smart contract? They don't give a shit, it's whatever. But if they were like, yo, like I for, I for real can go down and my reputation, my, my global reputation goes down. You know what I'm saying? People are more willing to uh, fulfill their agreements uh, once everything hits the blockchain, you know, theoretically. So this will mean you, what? What will it mean to actually own anything? If you could just rent out everything for profit, and everybody's renting out everything else for profit, and you need this, and that belongs to that, and that belongs to here, and that belongs to that, and you're making money off some things, and you're actually other people are making money off you on certain things. So like, it's like a whole renter center in your home, or you can make your home a whole renter center. You know what I'm saying? Or you know, so this is the future. This is the future. So my experience being a gig worker, was I ever a gig worker? Um, not for the companies, because I was in Hawaii and I didn't have a car a lot of the times or I had an old car, so I couldn't really do Uber. Um, they didn't have Postmates. Uh, I didn't have a place that rent out to do Airbnb. Um, so so I, I couldn't quite get my foot in the gig economy door, but I knew people around me working it at that time but what I ended up figuring out on my own was from someone else was all you have to do was ask or tell people what you want what you want and what you're willing to do I learned that from somebody who had a really nice place and I asked him how'd you get this place and he told me a story and I was like yo I could you know so what I did was and I had no skills at the time I'm on my own, damn near homeless, on and off homeless, like in and out of jobs, like, and I was sick of it, like, so what I did, what, and I was working, I had a, I had a new job every week, literally, I, you haven't met a person who has had more jobs than Crypto Roots, you haven't met a person who's applied for more jobs than Crypto, crypto Roots, you haven't met a person who's quit more jobs than Crypto Roots, I'm not lying, I know what it is to be in the struggle, you know what I'm saying, I know what it is, so... I, I, I was getting low pay, I was getting not treated, and what happened was is that I posted an ad on Craigslist about all the experience I had, what I'm willing to do, whether I had a car or not, then I said, I'm willing to learn a new skill if you're patient and respectful and can teach me, I'm willing to take less of a pay if you're willing to teach me a skill. I have a car or I don't have a car. I'm willing to meet you here, these are the hours I'm willing to work. This this is the pay I'm willing to accept. If it's not intensive, I'll accept, you know what I'm saying, this per hour. If it's physically intensive, I'll accept this per hour. 
Let I leave my phone number. These are the days, hours I'm willing to work. I called it how I wanted it. I said what I was going to do. I, I didn't I didn't just think, you know what I'm saying? I flipped the script and I hit up all my old bosses and I said I flipped I let them know I'm available for hire. You know what I'm saying? I'm not in I I switched it and I started getting phone calls left and right, left and right. All types of work was hitting me up. I I need help moving, I need help landscaping. My boyfriend is or my my friend this, so and so didn't show up, I need help, I need help. I was doing all types of gigs, painting, landscaping, farming, whatever, man. I, whatever, like, and I got to meet so many different people. I got so many different connections. I picked up so many different random skills. I actually, they, they treated me better and paid me more money. They treated me better and paid me more money. And I worked less hours. All because I decided to work for myself. All because I decided what I was gonna do. People respected me more. Are you booked? Are you booked? I was like, I was like, damn, like, people are like, are you booked? Are you booked, sir? Are you booked, sir? And I'm like, I had to. I was able to choose my own clients. I don't know. I don't feel like working today. I don't feel like working for that guy. Or you know what I'm saying? Da 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 da. Like I was. I had more control of my life, man. And because of my advertisement, uh, my ad was so effective. I could always rely on that. And people would hit me up. I wouldn't work for them for like a year. And I'm like, yo, you still want to... Work was always hitting me up. Still is today. I haven't even posted that for like two years. You know what I'm saying? I don't know how people still calling me back. But And also when I did the work, I did quality work. I did quality work. Depending on what I was doing, I shut up and work. If they wanted, if they wanted to teach me painting, they wanted to teach me something, I, I listen. You know? How often do you get paid to learn a skill? How often do you get paid to learn a skill? That's what people don't really understand about work, is that I I didn't see it as work. I saw it as uh, a a way to analyze every, uh, this, the people who was teaching me, the people I was working for. I was analyzing them. How will it is? How will it be? How? What kind of boss do I want to be? You know what I'm saying? How did this person start their business? I was more interested in their story, and I was willing to do the work to find out more who and what they are and what what mentality they had to get in that position. And then once people saw that, saw that like. My whole, my whole, I never look back. I always work for myself, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? I always work for myself. I always value my time and my energy. So if you want to take that next step, I'm going to just go over the process for you um, that you can kind of get started on your own as your own type of gig worker. You know what I'm saying? Your own type of gig worker. So yeah, decide, decide what low skills jobs uh, you have experience doing or willing to do. I don't care. I started off as a dishwasher, bro. Like I started off as a dishwasher. I worked my all my myself up all the way to the second one of the second best restaurants in America, like top best restaurants in Hawaii. Baker, um, uh, uh, desserts like uh, prep cook, seafood. Dude, I I didn't know nothing about cooking. I, I didn't even know how to wash dishes in a restaurant. But I needed to pay my 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 rent, dude. I needed some money, bro. But I saw it all as a way to like pick up skills and pe everyone that I was working with was like saw that like yo this dude's like I went from washing dishes to stretching pizzas to cooking uh, to cooking um, prepping food to making salads to cook I mean I just you know what I'm saying you're not gonna hold me back I'm not just gonna take something and just accept it for what it is I'm gonna make I'm all same thing that when I was working at the zoo I, I got hired at the zoo I was I was a zookeeper I was trained to become a zookeeper. And I got hired at the zoo um, to work for one month at night selling popcorn, bro, in Oakland. Like one month at night uh, selling popcorn, bro. I worked my way up to being a training to be a zookeeper, bro. I, I just, I, when I, once I saw an opportunity, most people quit, most, most people get fired, most people don't even wanna not sell popcorn. I said, yo, there's way better shit, there's way better opportunities here than me selling some popcorn, bro. Like. I just, I just, and I got my way up into the restaurant, and I got a membership, and then I went for the the, uh, the 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 zoo training program on the weekends. Like I was just like, yo, there's just so much more opportunity. I'm not gonna stay just like at this, not bottom, but like I, you know. And the people treat you way differently when you they see you coming up, you know. They, they what, what, even if it's in the workplace, you know. I was just one of those people that you gave me something, I made something out of it, and you know, especially being on my own. Um, without a job, you feel me? So yeah, this, but start. This is where you start. Start from any low low skilled job you have. Post an ad on Craigslist of what you're willing to do, what and what you expect, how you want to be treated, 
what you're willing to do for how much and how long. You know what I'm saying? It don't matter what it is. There's somebody that probably probably needs your service. People always need help moving. Construction sites always need help cleaning. People all people always need help landscaping. Winds get blown, you know what I'm saying? Like just just get get in. Get get an extra little 50 uh 50 100 a, a, a week. You know what I'm saying? Put a little in crypto while you you know what I'm saying? As savings while you're surviving off the rest. I know I did it, man. So always be available, always be available. Have you, that's how I became a little entrepreneur. It's like, I always had my phone on me. I knew my Craigslist ad was hit me up. I had Texas, uh, Texas and phone calls all day. I'm like, you know what I'm saying? And I just chose the best one. I listened to the voicemails, I got up the text. And I just chose like, yo, okay, cool. That kind of works for me, you know what I'm saying? If I didn't have a car, I told them where I'm in the ad, where I'm willing to go and be picked up at, you know what I'm saying? You could pay me a little less if you have to pick me up. You know what I'm saying? You could pay me a little less if you have to pick me up and p drop me off. I'm willing to work with you, man. Like, I ain't gonna just be kept broke. Like, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's just not me. So, and you'll be, you'll be surprised how many people are willing to help you. And from you working on their property, they're willing to let, let you live on their property. Then I got places to stay. I have my own crib. Just because, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, because of my work ethic and I kept it real with people, you know? I kept it real. I, I, you're not trying to kiss nobody's ass. But I, I, I kept it real and straightforward, and people appreciate that so much that they let me live on their land and look out for their whole land. You feel me? When you're doing these gigs, make sure you do quality work. Shut up. Keep your phone off. Don't talk. Ask if you can listen to music or not. Ask. You know what I'm saying? When you're working on your own and you're doing these random gigs, just be respectful. You know what I'm saying? And the more respect you show, the more you can get away with for a lot of these people, especially construction workers. The more they see that you're you're you're, you're not bullshitting, the, the 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 more relaxed construction workers get. The more like, all right, take it easy here, have a beer here, smoke a joint, whatever. Like, once they see you take the work seriously, that's when these people relax. That's when they call you back. That's when they give you tips. You know what I'm saying? It don't matter what race. You know what I'm saying? It don't matter what race. You know. Uh, I, I did a lot of work for white people and they appreciate and paid me more with more respect because they saw me working for it myself and not kissing their ass. You know what I'm saying? And I ended up just getting uh, my, you know, just better pay, better treatment, my own hours. Uh, you know what I'm saying? And with that, be, be a good report with your local neighborhoods. You always, for every person that you do good work that likes you, that wants you back, ask them, use them as a reference. Yo, can I use you as a reference? Yo, start, start once you, once people hit you back, you know what I'm saying? You, you start getting regular, and you know, use them as, use them as a reference. Use that person as a reference. Use and start building that, and then you good money no matter what. Especially because I was on an island. But same thing with your local neighborhood, like, or you know what I'm saying? You good money. There will always be some form of security, especially if you enjoy doing that kind of work. But while you're doing that kind of work, see what kind of more skills you can learn from. So that's how I worked it on my own. And I can always go back to that. I can always go, I can always, always go back to that if I ever need to. And that's a security, psychological security feeling is I know how to work for myself on my own, be my own gig worker, my own gig worker, you know? So I'm just giving you some strategies yeah, become your own boss while learning multiple skills. Be be your own boss while learning skills. I lived it. I'm telling you, I lived it. So that is that that was my presentation, people. So um I wanna have a little chat and just say thank you. I appreciate it. Um Hit me up, you know, I got hella game. I like to do these. This is fun. This is what I do. I hope you, hopefully you learned something. I'm going to keep this up for a day. <coughs> I'm going to keep this up for a day. And I'm going to take it down and it's going to be up for sale. Only because I put time and energy. No one, no one's really breaking down this game. And it just needs to be broken down too. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, much love. Uh, hit me up for the mentorship or check out the crypto courses. And um, yeah, aloha. Hopefully you learned something. Much love.